Hello again. In my last two videos for the Comfortable Word series, I've spoken about two different types of prayer, meditating on scripture and the Ignatian examine. This week, I'm going to talk about a form of prayer that is probably one of the most familiar, but it's also one of the forms that tends to raise questions for people. This is the prayer of petition. And petition is just a way of saying request. So when I speak about the prayer of petition, I'm simply talking about the form of prayer in which we ask God to do things, whether we're asking for things for ourselves or for others, or perhaps for the whole world. For many people, petition is an important part of their private prayer lives. And it's also a form of prayer that's familiar to us from our worship services. Petitions appear in every collect, in the intercessions at Holy Communion, and in many other places as well. Petition may even be the first thing we think of when we think about prayer, but it can also sometimes be a difficult thing for us to wrap our heads around. There's a work by C.S. Lewis called Letters to Malcolm, in which he writes letters about prayer to a fictional figure named Malcolm. At one point, Lewis writes, it is easy to see why so much more is written about worship and contemplation than about crudely or naively petitionary prayer. They may be nobler forms of prayer, but they are also a good deal easier to write about. But the discussion about the prayer of petition goes back much farther than this. From the earliest days of the church, preachers and theologians have sought to explain why we should set our petitions before God and what it is we accomplish in doing so. They speak of the prayer of petition as a way of showing our love and trust in God. And a great part of this trust is shown in our perseverance, in continuing to pray to God even when the things we pray for aren't necessarily granted in the way we imagined. St. Basil the Great, a fourth century bishop of Caesarea, writes in one of his sermons, we should give thanks to God for the good things he gives us and not bear it with bad grace that he measures his giving, for he disposes our lives more perfectly than we could order them. And it's this very thing, God's providence, or the fact that God is ordering our lives at all times that leads to a question many people have struggled with at one point or another concerning the prayer of petition. Why is it, after all, that the scriptures tell us on the one hand not to worry, that God knows our needs and will provide for us? But they also tell us to pray always and not to lose heart. What does Jesus mean when he tells Peter, Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. If God knows all things, and is already ordering all things for good, what is the point of praying? Of course, we could ask the same question about other things too, and not just about prayer. If God is ordering all things, what does it mean for us to do anything? St. Thomas Aquinas, writing in the 13th century, addresses this very question about prayer. And the answer lies in understanding God's providence, not only in terms of effects, but also in terms of causes. Not only has God ordained what is going to happen, he has ordained how it is going to happen. To borrow another example from C.S. Lewis, God may very well intend for you to have clean hands, and he may also intend for them to get that way through your decision to wash them. The same is true of prayer. If we believe that prayer is effective, as the scriptures assure us it is, we need to understand the decision to pray for something in the same way we understand any other decision we make in the course of our day. And if we truly believe that God is ordering all things, we will also understand that our petitions are a part of this ordering. It tends to be easier for us to believe that the physical actions we take are doing something, 
because we can see an immediate effect. We decide to wash our hands and we see them become clean. Or we decide to smile at someone and we can feel the corners of our mouth rising. But the truth is that we don't actually get to see the wider effect of most of our actions. We won't necessarily know how the stranger we smiled at felt about our smiling, nor will we know how the rest of her day may have been affected by our friendly gesture. I'm reminded, when I consider these things, of Jesus' words to Nicodemus when he speaks to him in the Gospel of John about being born again in the Spirit. He says, Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When it comes to natural events, we imagine that, under the right circumstances, we could entirely trace the pattern of cause and effect. But prayer is a spiritual act. It's an act of communion with God. And so its role in the unfolding of God's purposes can seem even more mysterious to us. But this is precisely why, when Jesus talks to the disciples about prayer, he connects prayer with faith. The fact that prayer is an act of communion with God is what he means when Jesus talks to his disciples about praying in his name. In his farewell address to the disciples, Jesus says to them, Very truly I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. Even earlier he said, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. In both cases, Jesus says this as he's explaining to the disciples that they will know the Father through him. He's explaining their relationship with God in terms of their relationship with him. And this is key to understanding what Christian prayer really is. When Jesus talks about praying in his name, he's speaking about his person. To do something in someone's name is to do it as an extension of that person. And what Christian prayer actually is, is our participation in Jesus' own prayer to the Father. We are praying his prayer with him, through the Holy Spirit. So Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This remarkable statement by St. Paul also addresses another question people sometimes have. What if I don't know how to pray? Or how do I know if I'm praying for the right things? Simply put, much of the time we probably won't be. But that's okay. Because the effectiveness of our prayer doesn't depend on us getting it right. Even the desire to pray, even just the decision to place our requests before God, is a good desire, and it's something God can work with. In fact, much of the time that we spend asking God for things is time we're spending learning how to pray. Just the act of asking God, instead of relying on ourselves or on purely human means, is an act of acknowledging God's providence. When we pray for God to bless or to heal us or to care for someone we love, we're expressing our confidence that he too desires our well-being. We know that we're not changing God's mind. Instead, we're changing ourselves and we're growing more and more into who we are as Christians. We're growing into that identity that shares in the person of Christ so that we're learning how to pray in his name. 
This is why the examples we're given of prayer in the Gospels involve a prayer for things to happen according to God's will. When Jesus prays to the Father in Gethsemane that, if possible, the cup of his passion might pass from him, he pairs it with, Yet not my will, but yours be done. And in the Lord's Prayer, the way that Jesus told us to pray when the disciples asked him to teach them. Again, before we ask for the particular things that we need for our daily bread, we say, thy will be done. We're learning whenever we pray to want the things that God wants. And we're learning to be who God wants us to be. When we begin the Lord's Prayer, or whenever we start a prayer by addressing God as Father, we're acknowledging that the prayer we're speaking is a part of the prayer of Christ, through whom we are also the children of God. It's important to let our prayers be shaped by these examples we've been given. Not only does the Lord's Prayer teach us that we are praying in Christ as the children of God, but it teaches us to adore God, hallowed be thy name. It teaches us to desire his will. And it teaches us to pair our petitions with an acknowledgement of where we've fallen short, to ask forgiveness and to forgive others as well. If we ever wonder whether we're saying the right things when we take the time to speak with God, we can always hold up our prayer time to the example of the Lord's Prayer to see whether one of those aspects is missing. But there may also be times when we find that we want to pray, but we can't find the words. In those moments, we can take comfort in another example from the Gospels that we don't always recognize immediately as an example of prayer. It's the first miracle Jesus performs in the Gospel of John when he turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana. But before we see this miraculous transformation, first we see the mother of Jesus come to him and tell him that they've run out of wine. She doesn't say what she thinks he should do about it. She simply tells him what's going on. They've run out of wine. And even when it seems like Jesus is telling her it's none of their business, when he says, what concern is that to you and to me? She nevertheless trusts that whatever it is he decides to do about it will be the right thing. She turns to the servants at the feast and says, do whatever he tells you. And so it can be with our petitions too. Even if we don't know the right words to address to God, we can still turn to him and tell him what it is we're going through trusting in the one who, as Paul says in Ephesians, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. I hope you found something that will be useful, or at least encouraging, in this brief look at the prayer of petition. If you're interested in talking more about any of the questions about prayer I've tried to address, or if you have others, please feel free to get in touch. And I'll leave you now with the following call out from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen.